Good morning. This is December 6, 1999, here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, part of our continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is part two of an interview with John Ray. Good morning, John. Good to see you again. Morning, John. How are you Good today? To Good to be with you and Barbara again. And uh, is it Paul? It's Robert. Robert. Two weeks ago when we talked, you covered uh, your experiences in the North African campaign and the invasion of Sicily. And you left us on what I thought was a kind of cliffhanger. You said uh, next time we talk, you're going to tell about a um, summons from Omar Bradley saying he wanted to meet you in London and talk about a big project that was coming up. Uh, I think we can take a wild guess as to what that project was. But can you tell us about it? <clears throat> yes, I can, John, to the best of my ability, 50, uh, 50, what, 54 years later. So we're in 1943, it's August, and we've finished, after 38 days, what could be called a lightning campaign in Sicily. And uh, General Bradley was designated uh, by General Marshall in Washington uh, to assume command of 1st United States Army uh, and to uh, develop that into a field army in England. And I was, dare I say, honored to be among the 22 uh, officers who were uh, permitted to accompany General Bradley back to England. We did so by, by ship uh, from Algiers in Algeria. Uh, on up to uh, until we got to Bristol, England, uh, and there we were to meet the other uh, members of the First Army staff who had come f from Governor's Island, New York, to England to form this headquarters, First Army, for General Bradley. During the uh, trip from Sicily to England, there was a week stopover in Algiers where uh, uh, we were given sort of an R&R &R period for about a week to uh, recover from the Sicily campaign. And then we were uh, about 14 days aboard a cruise ship, I will call it, from Algiers up to England. And we played uh, bridge all day and poker all night for uh, the next 14 days. I pocketed $400 of winnings. I suppose since we were out in the uh, seas at that time, there'd be no question about the gambling matters or betting or anything. But you know, $400 to a soldier uh, in those days of just pocket money that he didn't have to be concerned about his family or anything, just have it for play money, that was a big thing. And so uh, it was an experience for me to be the uh, t uh, uh, winner of all of that money which would help me in my activities in England thereafter. So, the First Army staff had been at Governor's Island for uh, many years, even decades, I suppose. Uh, its responsibility back here in the States uh, through all those years was managing the Army uh, matters and programs in the northeastern part of the USA uh, through war and peace. And now in '43, this staff was activated from that Governor's Island situation to come to England to create a real field army staff in, uh, <coughs> in England uh, for the attacks on the continent which would follow. What was England like in 1943 when you got there? Wow. By this time we must realize that the uh, English people had been under Hitler's uh, bombing and uh, uh, fire and machine guns and so forth from the air entirely, the British citizenry had been under this since 1939 or 40. So actually it was getting to be pretty old stuff around there by then, like four years that the people of England had been suffering all of the uh, 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 violence and also the 
uh, shortages of food and uh, clothing and fuel and water. Everything was in short supply. Uh, I could also say most especially men were in short supply because the British uh, young men were kind of all over the world at that time in their activities whether in uh, North Africa or Singapore and Malaysia and Burma and uh, India and uh, uh, Navy and Army kind of all over the world. This is a very important aspect of the whole matter that uh, uh, somebody had to take care of the British girls for one thing. Yes, somebody and, uh, had to do it. Yeah. Then it, it became <laughs> sort of a subsidiary responsibility of uh, some of the young soldiers. Fortunately, I was not one of those. By that time, I was age 25, you understand. So uh, I certainly was only a, uh, what dare I say, uh, supervisor of the soldiers in their uh, uh, situation. So you landed with $400 in your pocket, uh, <laughs> but Omar Bradley was also waiting for you. Um, where did you go immediately? How did you get, you get your feet down in Britain? Now, we'll understand, please, that a, a field army headquarters is a rather large organization. The headquarters itself, it is prepared to take full command of a force of uh, oh, I could say maybe, say, 200,000 men in all of the different aspects of Army affairs. And I'm emphasizing what a headquarters is all about. Mind you, in Africa, we had been in two corps, second to none, you recall. And, yes. uh, but First Army uh, uh, had to be a big headquarters with all kinds of logistic responsibilities. They're almost beyond imagination of our normal civilian world. You understand, we had to have hospitals, and we had to have uh, food supply, and blankets, and police, and every kind of thing that would be needed. So a headquarter, Army headquarters is a big outfit. And my responsibility, I was a staff officer in that headquarters, and my responsibility, you could say, was solely the matter of providing all of the munitions, the ammunition that is required in that, let us say, 200,000 man forts. And uh, <clears throat> any aspect such as this, say munitions, in those days, that included a, approximately 165 different kinds of munitions. These had to be supplied to uh, all of our uh, divisions and regiments and battalions and companies and individuals in this huge organization and, geographically speaking, sort of all over the continent. It becomes a logistic matter. And my concern, and uh, in large measure, I devoted myself, you could say, solely to the matter of the munition supply. It's not good to say that because it necessarily involves transportation and other things, trucks and trains and air and whatnot, to get the stuff there. It involves safety because munitions are uh, terribly dangerous explosives and they need to have a lot of uh, safety uh, rules and the execution of the same. I don't think probably here we want to get bogged down in a lot of that detail. I'm going to do my best to have, have the uh, audience and uh, everyone uh, uh, comprehend what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to uh, explain about without getting too lengthy. What was your rank at that time? At that time, time I was a major. Can you tell me something that I'd like to know personally and professionally here? Uh, you operated in a pretty rarefied atmosphere. You went into staff meetings and councils at the highest levels of the United States Army. That's true. Very few people have been there. Can you tell us what it was like to go to one of these meetings, how they were run, who presided, and how democratic were they? Well, that's quite an order and I'll do my best. <laughs> First, you understand that if we're in the field, out where the war is going on, where we were in North Africa for the earlier part of the description, there are staff meetings every morning <clears throat> where the commanding general uh, meets with his staff in order either to give them instructions or to learn from the staff what's going on in all the different departments. This is a big outfit running a war. You gotta, I guess, people realize that, and it has all different kinds of aspects to it. 
So uh, we had spoken about staff meetings in Sicily and also in mm -hmm. Africa, and these would be very small and very brief and very businesslike and not very much uh, uh, oh, uh, rules of Robert's order or anything like that. I, I am not suggesting that for a moment. At the same time, of course, the commanding general is always the boss. As one of them used to say to me, I am the boss. I'm not always right, but I'm always the boss. <laughs> Uh, but in any event, and this would uh, vary also between, are we speaking about General Patton or General Bradley? They ran their wars quite differently because their personalities were different. One of the great beauties of the United States Army, this variation in personalities, the fact that we are not as regimented as many think uh, that we are. Tell us about your boss, Omar Bradley. Excuse me, my... Your boss, Omar Bradley. Omar Bradley, wow. Yeah. You're coming at me pretty fast, John. Omar Bradley I'd known since I was a cadet, 17 years and two months old. I say known. I knew him kind of like a father or maybe like an uncle through those years, not to say any intimacy. He was possibly, uh, along with many other officers, a mentor for me. And so when he came to North Africa, as we talked about last week, uh, it was a great uh, boon to me to realize that I really feel as though I know something about my commander in a personal way, Omar Bradley. He came from Missouri, from Moberly, Missouri. A wonderful man, the last man in the world anybody would say was handsome, I guess. <coughs> he, uh, <coughs> the great thing about Omar Bradley is that when he trusted a staff officer, uh, which he commonly did do. He assumed that they were trustworthy. And having established by his experience with that officer that he was trustworthy, he gave him his head. He gave him full opportunity to, uh, to uh, blossom out and accomplish what really was needed without a lot of uh, uh, detail, trivia of instructions of things. He, he, could, he could delegate the authority to a trusted officer. I, I want everybody to realize in the meantime, if they were not trustworthy, they didn't belong on his staff at all. <clears throat> so uh, I was a beneficiary of that wonderful quality of General Bradley, namely that he trusted me. And so when we got to London, as you asked in your early question, what did he do? John, he said, I want you to find out what has been done about ammunition supply for the American troops here in England during the past three or four years uh, uh, in preparation for us being here now. In other words, you had staff people, uh, I'll dare to call them bureaucratic people, Americans who have been there for several years putting together the fundamentals, the groundwork, the underpinnings of what you needed to make the army go when it came over there for business. You imagine, imagine bringing in the hospitals, <coughs> the people for the hospital, all of the, the trucking, uh, arranging the real estate so that a million Americans could live on these little uh, islands of England. Think of all of the logistic aspect. All this had been done by the services of supply <coughs> during the previous couple of years, during 30, maybe probably 41 and 42, the, these preparations were made. Now. When you're preparing a campaign to go into uh, uh, Europe with several million American army troops, this means huge amounts of every kind of, kind of supply and a large share of it, a fraction of it, possibly as much as uh, uh, even 90 days of supply must be in England before the troops can jump off. It all has to be assembled there. It has to be there not just in huge crates and boxes and whatnot. It has to be in a, such a form that it can be fed out to the troops when they're committed in uh, Europe, can be fed out to them in a proper retail kind of fashion uh, right up to the uh, front lines and that every soldier has everything that he needs in terms of these 165 or so different ammunition items, that those things reach him when needed, where needed, and in excellent and safe condition. Did you find, John, that the ammunition was there or it, on the British Isles, 
or did you have to call up somebody in Kansas and <laughs> You're say You're almost it? quoting General Bradley now. <laughs> when, when he gave me my first order at this time, he said, <clears throat> the, the SOS, Service of Supply, has been gathering this stuff, as you know, for the last couple of years. Now, it is your responsibility now to determine what's here, what in fact actually is here. <clears throat> if all the shoes are here but there were no size seven or eight, you understand, you can't uh, outfit the army. You gotta have the right size and shape and all this stuff. This is logistic. If the gasoline is jet fuel and not diesel and we need diesel, well, that's no good. Everything has to be, uh, <coughs> has to be correct. So Brad said, <coughs> find out what has been done, what is here. John, this was the days before computers. Oh, yes. So yes. how in God's name, did you find lists, or how did you go about finding out, All right. answering so these questions? So in Octo questions? October of 43, uh, almost immediately after our arrival there, I went into the uh, U.S. Army Headquarters, uh, that means Services of Supply, European Theater of Operation, call it ETAUSA, they called it. <coughs> go in there, and I just ask a few simple questions of these, dare I say, more bureaucratic uh, army uh, officers and enlisted people that are there keeping yeah. clerical cover, clerical uh, uh, information about all this different stuff. What is it, where is it, and how much is it, and so forth. And so I simply said, I've come to see what munitions you have for my use, our use, General Bradley's use. <laughs> and. He hands me what looks like a stock market report of these 159 uh, items, and it begins up at the top with uh, whatever, alphabetically, and so and so, and ends at the bottom, uh, uh, it goes alphabetical through. I run down through this list, and my uh, hurriedly, I become pretty good at examining the numbers and all that, that go with all these munitions items by my uh, service with these same kinds of munitions in Africa and Sicily. I could go down that list pretty quick. And I came to mines, anti-tank, and I read that eight million had been brought there. Think of it. A mine is, looks like kind of home plate and baseball or something. And that's about what it's. I've got eight million of these. I say, my, that's a lot of mines. I say to myself, the next item I look at is mortar shells. M-I mine, M-O mortar. And we got 800,000 mortar shells. And the thing goes around like this. I don't have any books or anything, but I have a lot of uh, experience that is invaluable. I say to myself, how do we have a war with 8 million mines and 800,000 mortar shells? Things are backward. Mines are to defend and keep the enemy from coming into our territory. Mortars are to attack the enemy. We are on the attack going to Europe. This is to myself, within myself, I'm saying these things. So I turn to the uh, officers that have put this, uh, that are managing this whole matter, or keeping track of it. I say, we have things backwards, boys. These boys are twice my age. What rank are we these should boys? We should switch. <clears throat> we should have eight million mortar shells to attack and destroy the Germans. and. 800,000 mines will be plenty. You understand, 8 million mines, one soldier can lay four mines in one day. It takes us 2 million soldier days to bury those mines. We have to be succeeding in Europe in order to have these things to be usable. So let's switch the numbers like this. Now, I don't like to make too much of this, nor to be critical of anybody. It is not my purpose to be at all critical. It's a matter of bringing the experience of a newly experienced uh, uh, American war machine from two corps up to introduce First Army on how you got to do this thing. And mind you, there would be similar questions analogous to this that would have to do with hospital beds and sheets and this kind of thing, or blankets or food or gasoline. Every one of the logistics departments uh, is uh, 
finds that we have analogous situation and we got to get with it. We have to be able to have thousands of trucks to move this stuff uh, around when we get ashore in Europe. We can't, of course, get the trucks in unless we're already winning, right? We got to be getting in there across Omaha Beach and all doing this, which I'll get to uh, shortly. So we go over these numbers and the, the officers, uh, when I tell them we've got to switch the 8 million and the 800,000, uh, they're astonished. They've been working for a couple of years bringing this stuff over. And what does that mean? More than bringing it over, creating it, manufacturing it, back here at Picatinny Arsenal, at other places, wherever it may have been in the States or in General Motors. And this would apply to every kind of supplies. It had to be re-examined by experienced soldiers, even if they're 24 years old. Okay, John, let me ask you a question. This is August of 43. October by now, yeah. October, all right, then you've got eight months till D-Day, yeah. seven and a half. Did you know the date of D-Day at that time? No, I did not. Did you know your deadline is what I'm asking here? Well, gee, your questions are wonderful. <laughs> yes, I, I was, uh, you know, somewhat up the scale in, uh, in uh, position in this whole matter. I was neither at the top nor at the bottom. And uh, yes, it was necessary that people that were in, uh, 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 dare I say, uh, thinking capacities and whatnot, uh, uh, visionary uh, capacities, had to know things, but not in every single detail. So probably as of October, I probably worked with the ideas, we better have this done before summer, something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, the generals themselves, Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton, and so forth, they wouldn't have been able to answer the question you've asked at that time. The date had not been chosen. The date would be refined as time went along, and it would depend on so many things, of course, one of them being weather, but uh, also many other things. The successes of our forces in other theaters of war would have to do with all of this thing. So I, I did not, of course, then know that it would be the month of June, but I would have said that it, uh, I would have known it would be early summer, let's put it that way. <clears throat> but even that, always oh, subject to change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, about this eight million and 800,000 bit, uh, I knew that these uh, officers in London would not be able to accept my word that we're going to change these things that quickly, I simply informed them that uh, I would get, get General Bradley's authority to demand this. And it took about two seconds of my time back with him in Bristol in order to assure that I was correct, that it was what he wanted done. Think of what that meant in the arsenals back home, where it meant the whole manufacturing program had to be changed. This is big. And it was changed. And uh, things uh, went, went all right about that. You spoke um, last time we talked about meeting General Eisenhower. Yes. And you spoke just a few minutes ago about meeting the Queen of England, or at least being in Buckingham Palace while you were there. Could you tell us about that? Well, <laughs> this is Thanksgiving Day of 1943. England did not, in fact, have a queen at that time. England had King George VI, was the king of England at that time. And to my surprise, about a week or two before Thanksgiving Day in November, that is American Thanksgiving Day, uh, in November of uh, 43, <coughs> General Bradley's chief of staff, wonderful man, Major General William B. Keane, K-E-A-N, uh, <coughs> General Keane informed me that uh, I had been invited to Buckingham Palace for Thanksgiving Day. Uh, not much detail was given me at the moment. <laughs> it was clear that I was not the only such person invited. <clears throat> but it turned out, I'll brief it as fast, as simple as I can. Uh, apparently King George VI <clears throat> had uh, asked General Eisenhower to nominate a small number, 100 people, to uh, come to the palace for American Thanksgiving Day in November of 43. And so uh, through whatever 
reason or whatnot uh, when General Eisenhower received that uh, uh, invitation for a hundred of his uh, men and women to be there, uh, I was one of those. And uh, I didn't, uh, no explanation was given to me as to why or what it was about or anything except it was just kind of a friendly gesture by His Majesty. So I went there, uh, somebody gave me a limousine or something to go to Buckingham Palace in. I suppose that would have been General Keane, and uh, when I got there I was uh, uh, matched up with Quentin Roosevelt, who was a young Harvard graduate my age uh, and my uh, branch of the service field artillery, and uh, Major Quentin Roosevelt was from the 33rd Field Artillery of the 1st Infantry Division, United States Army, and had been through the same campaign as I had been in North Africa and Sicily. He was grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt. He was son of Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., who was also an officer in the 1st Infantry Division. And so we two young majors uh, were the very first two Americans to meet the King and the Queen on this day in 43. The Queen, of course, is still today the Queen Mother, and uh, having been born, I believe, in 1903, I think that's right, uh, she is today uh, 96 years old, and she's still getting along pretty well. That's the Queen Mum. Well, so Quentin and I uh, went into a lovely uh, reception hall in the Buckingham Palace, and King George VI and uh, the Queen, uh, Queen Mother, what we call her today, she was simply called Queen Elizabeth in those days, uh, they welcomed us into their home, uh, just the two of us, and uh, it was understood it would be a, a, just a brief little uh, uh, acquaintance or something, and uh, uh, after a, a few minutes of introduction by uh, some equerry of, the, of his staff, um, the king said to me, uh, <clears throat> where have you come from, like today? I said, well, last uh, month I came from Sicily. He said, uh, what were you doing in Sicily? And I said, Second Corps was, uh, along with uh, his Eighth Army, was defeating the Germans and the Italians in Sicily. He said, why are you not now in Italy? And uh, this was the toughest question of security that has ever been given to me in 33 years in the army. The King of England says, why are you not in Italy? Now, the King of England is not a part of the military structure of either America or Britain, and I am top secret cleared for all of the information that uh, is available to me. What did you tell him? So I thought for no longer than 10 seconds. And I said, Your Majesty, I have come with General Bradley for the purpose of preparing for the attack on Europe. In doing so, I was well aware that it was not, as they say these days, it was not within my pay grade to inform him of an attack on Europe. But I just put it through my own private system and conscience and decided that to tell him that what much I would take that risk. Most soldiers, most officers uh, would be very, very, very touchy, as was I, about taking the risk of informing him. But I tossed my coin, my mental coin, and I did it. And His Majesty was kind enough, I would say, not to pursue the matter. He could have, and I could have been very uncomfortable. He did not do so. I thought that was fun. Uh, I would commend him 55 years later for his own, uh, uh, dare I say, uh, behavior and deportment in this situation. Incidentally, he was dressed in a military uniform on that day. And uh, his, his wife, uh, you don't call her Her Majesty because she herself was not a royal person but she was a lovely uh, matron, 
Mind you, she was only 43 years old that day, and today she is 96. Well, John, yeah. let's get as much as we can the flavor as you rapidly approach D-Day now. Well, I, I, I don't want to leave Buckingham Palace for a minute. No, just a minute and then we can do that play. Okay. Uh, so Quentin and I were next taken in the next room and there we were received by Princess Elizabeth and her kid sister Margaret Rose. And Princess Elizabeth, who today is Her Majesty the Queen, uh, was born in 1926, so she was 17 years old at that time. She too was in full uniform of the Auxiliary ter Territorial Service, that was like the Women's Army Corps of the British Army, and we had a few minutes together. Her kid sister was 13 years old at that time and was dressed up as a little girl, ought to be for a birthday party or something in her whatever pinafore or whatever you might say. So we did have those few minutes with also with those two princesses, and it was a wonderful time. I was then uh, uh, just for a few minutes. I was then taken out into the larger hall where I was assigned to escort the Duchess of Kent, who years before had been the Marina, uh, Princess Marina of Greece, and she had married the Duke of Kent. He was brother of King George VI, the youngest brother, I think. He had been killed only months before. I believe it may have been 14 months prior to my visit that he was killed in the RAF uh, in the Battle of Britain in 1940 or 41. Uh, he had been killed in that, so his beautiful young wife, reputed to be about the most beautiful young woman in the world. I have no way to make any judgment about that myself, John, nor would you, I'm sure. But she uh, did a pretty good job at that. And uh, she was still in a grieving situation and so it wasn't exactly all beer and skittles uh, having a date with her there. But in any event, it went very nicely and we can leave the Buckingham Palace at that time. I think you're one of the few people in this world that I've ever talked to that has been at Buckingham Palace. I'm glad we had this situation. But um, I think a great deal of pressure must have been on you and your responsibilities as June the 6th loomed rapidly on your horizon. When did you know, or did, can you think back as when you knew, when you would go ashore in Normandy? We would spend the period from November on around the clock, on into March and April, preparing, refining, everything about bringing this huge force to England. Lots and lots of men. You can imagine the real estate problem taking care of all of this kind of, uh, this whole massive project. England is not a large place. We had all these people and all of this huge amounts of supply, all this to, uh, uh, to accommodate and to have in, in good shape. You know, soldiers are no good if they're, not, uh, if they're not tuned up and ready like a football team. They've got to be ready all the time. So everybody had to be uh, uh, commanded and, and uh, held to high standards and must learn what lessons have been learned in Africa and Sicily and elsewhere in the world that will improve their, uh, their fighting abilities while they're there. It's a, it's a big project. And so I will say that the the date of early June, as far as I knew, uh, became fairly well kind of established as early June. I'm not going closer than that. Early June was probably established maybe about uh, maybe April of 44, that that was pretty well refined. Uh, <clears throat> final decision always up to Eisenhower, of course, but, uh, and never could be reached until even the last minute because weather would be a very important factor. But if you accept for the moment, we're talking about early June, that then allows us to uh, take care of all of the other different aspects of having the whole force ready, <clears throat> including, you know, think of the number of boats and ships it's going to take to get all this across the mm -hmm. channel. All this has got to be assembled or even manufactured back home. And uh, so uh, probably in April, the June date became uh, fairly clear to us. and. Uh, Next question, please. Did Omar Bradley personally, from reading your history here, 
tell you what he expected of you on the 6th of June? I want to make real clear, there were people in between me and Brad, uh, several uh, important echelons of command in between. Mm -hmm. It is not as though I was his personal aide de camp. It is not as though I was uh, uh, doing business with him daily. It is not like that. I, I probably had uh, something to do with him almost daily, but uh, uh, there, there were other echelons of command between me and him. Uh, please uh, understand okay, that as I, I respond. That. <coughs> um, and now our army, same in the Navy I suppose in the Air Force, our army uh, has certain procedures which assure that we don't have to give every bit of instruction on every single item uh, every time it happens. Some things become what we call standing operating procedure. And we, we understand, generally speaking, I'm maybe philosophizing a little bit, that the commanding general, in this case Bradley, assumes that Colonel Ray, uh, Major Ray, uh, uh, and others in his staff are doing what they're supposed to do and solving all of the problems without bringing every single problem to him. There are numerous problems all the time, and that's what we were solving between November and June. And he knew full well that I and the others on his staff, if we had things that were big bad trouble or something, we would let him know real soon, uh, and, uh, or better yet, we would correct them. As you prepared yourself for yeah. the, when you knew the day, and you prepared uh -huh. yourself for the 6th of June, yeah. uh, I think I read a little while ago that you and Bradley arrived on the 7th, is that That's right? very true. Tell us about that, please. Let's picture now the whole attack force that's going to attack Normandy Beach, Omaha and uh, Utah Beach, and also airborne attacks going in without a beach. And so I'm speaking now of Army affairs particularly, <coughs> that all these things uh, are happening and it requires great amounts of sea lift, we call it, boats and ships to get us over the channel, even though the mileage is not great. Everything is assembled in these ships. And General Bradley had his headquarters, or I will say a nucleus of his headquarters, on the same ship with him. <clears throat> and so when the morning came, when the attack was made on 6th of June, which is the famous D-Day of, uh, well, people think that's D-Day of the whole world, but that's D-Day of the Normandy campaign. When that uh, attack was made and uh, four American divisions attacked the Normandy beach along with several in uh, British divisions under General Montgomery. They were all attacking Normandy beach and <clears throat> General Bradley's staff people as distinguished from the fighters in the foxhole now, I'm making that distinction, <coughs> is that uh, I, I was advised probably late on the 6th that tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock maybe, uh, you will accompany General Bradley ashore. Now, he was going ashore in a very small craft. In my brain, I cannot remember today exactly what that craft was. I do not remember that. And Brad was going ashore with just two or three people that he felt that he wanted to have right beside him. Why, the, why these people? In my own case, it would be because General Bradley was well aware that the ammunition supply, if it is uh, less than uh, excellent at the time, that the attack could not succeed. This is not a prediction that it will fail, but <coughs> this is a kind of caution that he, uh, he took at the time. He must have put ammunition ahead, let's say, of uh, uh, mess kits as being important to that day's attack. And so he took my, me and uh, several other people in other departments, perhaps transportation or something else, he took them right beside him so that if he found trouble, he could push the button that really would react. I hope I get through with that point without in any sense seeming egotistical. I don't mean to say that at all. There were far, many, many, many people, far more competent 
than I in their departments, but his feeling, Brad's feeling, was that on that day the munitions uh, become a very high priority or you can't do a thing. I hope this answers the question. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's how, how come I go in with him. So at about perhaps nine o'clock in the morning, the small craft, whatever it was that we were in, uh, went ashore on the sands of uh, Normandy Beach and General Bradley and two or three other persons and I got out when we could almost get out with dry feet. And by that time, of course, uh, the, the Battle of Normandy is about 30 hours old. So the fighting is, not, is no longer right at the shore, which it was yesterday. The, our troops have moved in shore uh, some number of hundreds of miles, of, of out yards, I mean to say, some number of hundreds of yards are fighting infantry. Heroic troops have moved in that far. And here the four-star general and his lieutenant colonel Ray, he promoted me a little before this, and a few uh, other people are going in to see what we can do to help the troops do better, if they need anything. In my department at that time, we found no problem in my area. I will say we found other terrible things on that beach. <clears throat> the most memorable sight I can think of is the dead soldiers, American soldiers, who had been killed the day before or the night before on that beach and their bodies wrapped in blankets or body bags or whatever were the first thing that we saw when we got out of the our little landing craft on that beach. These were largely soldiers from the 29th Infantry Division from Maryland and Virginia on that day in this exact place. Okay, this is the 7th of June. You're ashore, you're in Normandy, you're in France, you're in Europe. What were your orders to do then? I want to just give a little, one little incident at that time. As Brad got out of the, uh, this landing craft, he saw an American infantry company coming ashore at the same time, wading in up to their hips probably. And he saw that uh, these men were all soaking wet, their rifles were wet like this, and uh, it, I'm sure it caused a degree of concern within him for those men. Now mind you, he mustn't be tied down by one company. This general is commanding like uh, probably 50,000 troops on shore at this time. He mustn't get sidelined, but uh, it's in Brad's nature that he does a bit. He turns to the commanding officer of that company, a captain of infantry, U.S. Army, and Brad took off his own jacket and he handed it to the company commander saying, one of your men needs it more than I. Never mind it had four stars on the shoulder, he handed it out that way. <clears throat> well, Bradley, General Bradley really gave me hardly any instructions at that time. He need, he need not. <clears throat> he, he never should be in a position really of having to give very much instruction to a staff officer in such a position. Maybe to the Brigadier Generals and, ma mm -hmm. and Major Generals who are who are up at the top of the whole pyramid, but uh, presumably I must know what I'm supposed to do. And the answer would be, and I'm, I don't mean to be evasive of your question, he probably just wished me good luck and told me he would see me at uh, his new uh, uh, temporary headquarters, which would be established uh, before the day is over, uh, uh, in shore. That's probably all he had to say. He need not say to me, call me if you need me. He knows I will. All right, John. This is a, a drama, a play of enormous drama and scope. Sure. I happen to have seen the third act of this. I know what is going to happen to you in the next couple of days. I know that you were wounded in action and that you got a purple heart. And I know that you were made again a prisoner of war. Can you tell us about this? What happened to you that you got into that situation? We're beginning in the first week of June, 1944. 
My capture happens to have been on December 17, 1944, which tomorrow, I guess, will be 55 years ago. And that happens up in uh, the, uh, what's been called the, uh, what do they call it? The <laughs> Battle of the Bulge. Best um, I yeah. think about my waistline uh, <laughs> more with that. that. And mind you, that's up in, in Belgium. So by that time, our, between June and December, our forces have been developed into a huge force. Our first army has crossed the beach there on 6th of June. General Patton's third army will be coming in uh, soon behind it. The two armies will be side by side after General Bradley has taken his army out to Brest, I think it is. And then the two armies side by side have gone on into Paris in July and August. <coughs> we have deferred to General uh, de Gaulle. I say we, I'm speaking now of General Eisenhower, really. Uh, General Eisenhower has permitted General de Gaulle to take the French forces into Paris for reasons of his own, very good reasons, patriotic reasons, that Paris could appear to be taken by the French forces in August. I myself was in Paris in August next. We then move on into uh, eastern uh, France and on up into uh, Belgium. And as this time moves along, the forces now are huge in the continent, American, British, French, uh, and many more from the, uh, dare I say, the uh, allied countries. And also Europe is being attacked from the uh, south, from uh, Italy and all, by other forces under General uh, Devers and General Mark Clark. I don't want to get mixed up in what I say here. We're getting into a huge uh, whole outfit. And one of the uh, results of all this is supply shortages of everything. We didn't have supplies enough to support our forces, be it gasoline, be it doctors, be it food, be it whatever it was, trucks, men, everything was in short supply. In a word, we had, had run ahead of our supply line. And this, this is where General Patton comes in uh, to the matter in his personality. I think he is quoted somewhere as having said, stop all the rest of the forces, let Patton's Third Army finish this war for you and give us all the supplies and we can do the job. Something like that. Not really a quote from General Patton, but approximately that would be the essence of it. Well, the war didn't work that way. So by now, General Bradley, Omar Bradley, had been moved up himself from army commander to the still higher commander that most Americans have never even heard of. It was called 12th Army Group. It meant that Omar Bradley was there commanding three armies, three field armies, which together formed what was 12th Army Group. Bernard Law Mont Montgomery had another Montgom uh, British Army Group, British plus Canadian. And so we had about three army groups in the whole continent of Europe, and everybody was short of supply. I say everybody was short of supplies. Things were very, very serious. In November, I was in the Hurtgen Forest visiting the 4th Infantry Division. I visited there with uh, old friends with whom I had uh, uh, known them back in the States and in at West Point as cadets and so forth. Uh, I always kept in touch with my uh, former associates if I could during the heat of battle or any other time. <clears throat> and I just will recall a remark by Major General Raymond O. Barton, sometimes called Tubby Barton, and I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, and I said, General, I've heard that the 4th Infantry Division has had the greatest number of casualties of all of the American forces in Europe. And here's what Tubby Barton responded. John, you staff people just do not understand. Our infantry platoons have suffered 200% casualties. True, the division of the, as a whole has suffered about maybe 70% casualties, but the infantry platoon is where the fighting goes on, and they've suffered 200% casualties. So I think it's very important. Probably most of the men you'll speak, you'll speak to here were in infantry platoons. John Ray was not. These are the heroes. 
heroic men out front. Yes, John. I was just saying that 200% casualties means that every reinforcement that came in was also killed. Uh, uh, yes. Or yes. wounded. Yes. That's the idea. Edge in. Officers and enlisted boat. Get closer now to Bastogne oh. and the Battle of the Boat. Yes. <coughs> By December 16th, evidently Hitler and his generals saw that if they're going to ever save their country from this war, it better be right now. And Hitler gathered all the forces he could for the purposes of a knockout punch against the United States and British armies, both of which were short of supplies and weakened by that shortage. And this is where the Battle of the Bulge starts to begin. It's where Bastogne begins and Malmedy begins and the other uh, places that uh, history books are noting. And so we found on the 16th of December, to our horror and, I must say, from my point of view, surprise. Now, it's not fair for me to say surprise entirely, because some people may have known. But John Ray did not know that this was going to happen, anything like it. And the German forces attacked and destroyed many American units and gave all kind of trouble to other units that it did not destroy. I don't think I should get far into the Battle of Bastogne, although your timing on that is quite correct. And that's where, like Harry Kennard, my classmate, is, uh, uh, created that message for General McAuliffe to say, nuts to the Germans. That was Harry Kennard at, uh, at uh, Bastogne and General McAuliffe. And uh, it brings General Patton and, and Colonel Creighton Abrams all into this. But my personal experience was not quite at Bastogne, it was maybe 40 miles away. Tell us about that, and, then, John. Uh, in the northern part of the First Army sector, by this time, incidentally, General Courtney Hodges was the First Army commander, Courtney Hodges, and Bradley had moved up a step, as I said, to 12th Army Group. And I remained with Hodges and his staff, General Keene. And <coughs> my immediate uh, senior officer in my business was uh, Colonel John B. Medaris. Uh, Medaris uh, later on in his life became one of America's uh, uh, supreme uh, rocket uh, people in our uh, American army. That would be a whole other subject, very important, but it's not really my business. And uh, Medaris at that time was a colonel and uh, was my boss. His assistant was Colonel Floyd A. Hansen and he also was my boss, and so I was called in by these on the 16th of, of uh, December and informed that the American logistic forces, that means my people, the ammunition supply people, the food supply people, the uh, engineer people and so forth, that various of these logistic or service uh, agencies uh, were in great danger to the German attack which had already wrought great damage to our frontline soldiers up and down the whole uh, army group front. And I was instructed uh, late on the 16th of December, I was given a list of various units I was to go and inform of the seriousness of the situation and cause them to take appropriate action to move to safer position. Uh, this is up in uh, eastern uh, Belgium. <coughs> uh, I don't know if I can pull out the names of the towns uh, on short notice, but uh, <coughs> they'll come to me if I need them. Spa, Belgium, is where, where our headquarters were. Spa as in bath, as in bathtub. And uh, so Colonel Medaris instructed me to inform these troop units that they were to, uh, uh, including ammunition units, they were to uh, move in an emergency situation, if necessary, destroy their supplies even to save the men and to keep the uh, uh, destroyed supply from the hands of the German uh, forces. Well, on that morning of December 17, uh, I had arranged to go by Jeep with my uh, Jeep driver. I'm sorry to say I don't remember this one's name uh, as of this morning. <laughs> yes, it was. It was Pyre, P-Y-R-E-E. -E. He was a, a, probably a corporal. 
at that time, and so uh, Pyrie and I were to take this jeep and go around and uh, inform the commanders of these uh, logistic units of the danger of their situation and tell them what to do or uh, trust them to make that decision themselves. <clears throat> Before doing so, I called my younger brother Roger Ray, uh, a West Point graduate class of 1943. This was only about a year after his graduation, mind you. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he happened to be working in the same First Army headquarters I was. He was in intelligence duties. That has to do with uh, information of the enemy forces. The reason he was in this was that he had been severely wounded back on the beach in Normandy. He had been hospitalized in England for uh, several months uh, recovering from the severe damage to the uh, lower parts of his body. And uh, uh, after he finished his hospitalization there, he, Roger Ray, joined Captain, I guess he was a lieutenant then. He then was assigned to First Army Headquarters and just by coincidence that way, he was near me. I was able to telephone Roger and say to him, please meet me for breakfast tomorrow morning about five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. And uh, he, he was uh, nearby, he came for breakfast and uh, we had a little time. I told him uh, very briefly what I was up to. I told him there was no certainty I would be back and therefore would he kindly take care of my 1939 ring for, for me until I came back and I handed it to him at that time. That's your graduation ring from West yes. Point. Yes, yep. He took that at that time. That was only a little family formality and uh, he was kind enough to take care of it and uh, uh, we still have it today because he returned it to me later after the war was over. Well. Uh, so uh, Pyrie and I jumped in the jeep as soon as my little breakfast was over and went out on our mission. We were hardly a matter of, uh, I'll say, less than five miles from Spa, from the headquarters. It may have been much less, it may have been two miles, I just cannot remember. When lo and behold, I felt a terrific bang on my head, on my steel helmet. It's the first time in my life I'd ever been hit by rifle fire for real. Turned out it was rifle fire, hit the steel helmet, <coughs> and uh, it was more like a, uh, it felt more like the, like the blow of a baseball bat than anything I imagined that a little rifle bullet would cause. I learned, possibly you gentlemen have had it happen some other way, and you know that I was wrong all this time thinking that a rifle bullet would feel like uh, like a rifle bullet. It felt like a baseball bat. And um, in any event, uh, I was hit, hit there and uh, I guess that other machine gun bullets must have hit uh, the moving parts of my Jeep and turned us over into the ditch and Pyrie and I found ourselves in the in the ditch and before seconds had passed, German soldiers were around us, not in great numbers, three or four uh, men and obviously they were in, char in charge. Whether it was rifle fire or uh, machine gun fire, I cannot be sure. Doesn't make much difference. They managed to right the Jeep and start, start the Jeep and they put Pyrie and me in the back seat of the Jeep and two German soldiers, one driving and one uh, sitting beside him and on we went. We were prisoners at that point. How severe was your wound, John? <clears throat> well, uh, it wasn't until a few minutes later that I realized I was wounded at all. This bullet had gone through the maple leaf on my helmet, which signifies Lieutenant Colonel, and had gone right through that leaf and through the outstanding work of the United States Army, uh, perhaps the Army Quartermaster from Natick, as it's sometimes called, that helmet had been so designed that it could deflect the bullet and the bullet went up the, and took the, tra the trajectory the tra helmet itself forms and it went out the back of the helmet without major damage to this body. Uh, there was blood uh, uh, streaming down in rather considerable amount, impressive amount down on my shirt and all, but the damage, uh, I have to say later on, really was superficial. There was no uh, substantial damage to this man's body. Who I've told all my friends since then, if you got to hit me, hit me in the head, it doesn't seem to hurt. Who gave you first aid, John? 
Well, a few seconds later, we passed on our left with where the jeep is in motion. The German is driving it, another German beside him. And I looked over here in this big empty field, and lo and behold, in this empty hay field, I saw what I estimate to be 200 American soldiers uh, herded together in a body, and obviously they too were prisoners. And among these soldiers that I saw across the field, I noticed they were wearing Red Cross brassards on their arm. Three or four different men were wearing the Red Cross brassard, which signifies that he's, he's a medical corpsman, that he's there uh, as a medic with his, uh, with his outfit. When I saw these men with their uh, medical uh, badges on, I turned to the German and said, I want to go for first aid treatment to my head when I saw these American corpsmen. And believe it or not, this was the German's response. You are, you are wounded. You cannot go and join those men. That was the, his, the essence of his response. A lot of these Germans spoke pretty good English. I'm not quoting exactly, but because you're wounded, you cannot join these men. And we went on our way. I'm going to interrupt that scenario here just a minute to say that I soon learned Sometime within the next 48 hours, I learned that those 200 men were assassinated then and there. We had a mass murder, one of the largest of the total war two, a mass murder of 200 or so American prisoners of war right out there on that field, every man on that field. And this has later been known in the history books, although not well known, as the Malmedy Massacre. And all of those men were put to death by the Germans then and there. This one, because he was wounded, was not permitted to join that. That's a terrible story, John. I, and terrible in the sense of uh, frightening as to the ferocity of the situation you were in. Where were you taken in that jeep? <coughs> Next, we were taking to what the, is known military as a holding area for prisoners. It's just a pirie and me, mind you, that's all. We, took, we were taken there to, and we found there were perhaps a couple of dozen other American prisoners that were being held in a very makeshift situation out in the woods uh, by some Germans. And the, the Germans also had some captured American vehicles, some tanks, some half tracks, some trucks. And soon thereafter, <clears throat> I never know why it is, but I was identified again as the senior American officer present. I was instructed by the Germans to refuel those trucks, American trucks and tanks, so that they could be used by the Germans. I accepted that assignment by the Germans. I don't know what the uh, training manuals may say about that, but uh, I know my own conscience and I know my own, uh, I know my army, I think, fairly well. So I accepted that assignment, assignment to refill, mind you, in the dark, out in the woods, to refill the tanks of these cars, uh, of the tanks and trucks. So I instructed the other, other prisoners who were there, possibly eight of us, I instructed them that yes, they were to carry out this order, but with every two cans of gasoline that they poured into the uh, 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 tanks and the trucks, they were to put in one can of water. I figured that would take care of the matter uh, satisfactorily in order to disable the tanks before they ever started. And so we did do that. Uh, it happens that the Germans call their uh, fuel tanks, they call them jerry cans. I should better yet say the Americans called German fuel cans, five gallon cans. Jerry we cans. always call them jerry cans, yeah. named in honor of the German jerrys. And our, our gas cans and our water cans were in those days identical, except there was a G for gas and a W for water imprinted in the can. And maybe the Germans didn't understand too much about our little symbol of G and W. That could be. I simply told my men, put in two cans of gas, one can of water, and go to it. Fill them all. You were taking an awful chance there, weren't you? Well, life is a risk, uh, John, and war is a risk. And uh, I figure that's the 
uh, nearest thing that I can do is to uh, is to continue my military service by disabling their stuff. That's all I've. That's my own thinking on the matter, and uh, uh, I suppose we could kick it around some. Uh, <laughs> I only say even today life is a risk. Uh, okay. All right. How I, did you? How, you were a prisoner again. Uh, I was then time. a prisoner. I had been identified as a wounded prisoner. And obviously you're not going to stay in the holding area very long. Uh, the forward commanders of the German army are anxious to get rid of you so they can get on with their job of defeating the main American army. So they ship us out. Because I was wounded, I was shipped out in a truck. Others who were not wounded were shipped out on foot. It was very snowy, by the way. At this time, there was a, a more than a foot of snow on the ground everywhere around Mamadi and Spa and so forth. It was cold. It was a real uh, winter at that time, December 17th. Uh, we were trucked to a place called Limburg, L-I-M-B-O-U-R-G, as like in cheese. And in Limburg, we found that uh, we were in with some, uh, possibly uh, a couple of thousand, maybe, of uh, prisoners. This is a tough time for U.S. Army and British Army. Some of our finest units and some also of our very inexperienced units had been terribly decimated. And here were a couple of thousand uh, American and British prisoners in this huge barn in Limburg. And who do you suppose the senior American officer? As usual, 25 years old now, but probably the only lieutenant colonel in the outfit. And it was just a few days, of course, before Christmas. Uh, not that that meant a whole lot to us, and yet it always does to America. And uh, I began to realize by this time, I guess you'd have to say with it, with the North African experience, I was the most experienced prisoner of war in the place, I guess. I knew something about being one, and I knew something about our captors, and I don't like to stress the I part of it, because that's not a nice thing to do, and it would be very wrong. Every man there was important. Let me just mention one little experience that came up at that time, because uh, some of these things will help uh, future native people, uh, native people, to understand a little bit about some of the sidelines of the war. The senior uh, uh, German medical person present was a warrant officer. Warrant officer, that's something less than a physician. He's more like a t uh, technician within their whole medical system. And this German warrant officer came to me and he said, you must come to the clinic. Imagine, with some 2,000 men, uh, many of them uh, sick, wounded, lame, or lazy, whatever, of prisoners. They had this one little clinic, possibly about the same size as this room. He took me there, this German warrant officer, medical warrant officer, and he said, now look, we have a very special problem. There is no doctor in this entire uh, organization here at Limburg, and therefore we have two Americans who require euthanasia. And since we have no American or German doctor present, or British, the decision must be made by the senior officer of their country. And so I'm required to get your approval before we administer euthanasia to these two soldiers. We then walked into a room this side, and here were the two American soldiers on their cots. Both had their heads bound right around like this. And he told me that in both cases, these men had had their forward area of the brain. I'm not coming up with my words right today. Uh, they, um, it's a frontal lobotomy. In uh, the yes, worst, right. Worst they, sense. For, Right. The frontal lobes in both cases had been destroyed on the battlefield and thus euthanasia was necessary. But it requires the approval of the senior American officer. I'll let you guess what my response was. No way. We don't do that. To this day, of course, I don't know what happened to those two patients. I only know I did not authorize euthanasia. And the following day, I was summoned to the office of the prison commander, who placed me in solitary confinement, where I stayed for eight days. 
I do not mean to say this happened because of that decision. I'm not saying that at all. I think more likely it happened because I was the only lieutenant colonel around and they wanted to find out something about my army, our army, General Bradley's army, General Hodges' army. So I was put in solitary confinement at the sixth floor of a castle on these grounds in Limbourg, alone. No food, no toilet facilities, no nothing for uh, six or it may have been eight days, I'm not sure. <coughs> and on New Year's Eve, I was summoned down to the office of the man, the German, in charge of this facility. And here's how he greeted me. He says, Colonel, I just couldn't think of the old man being up in the sixth floor uh, uh, solitary confinement on New Year's Eve. It just didn't seem right. So you and I are going to have a party. There's a bit of humor you understand inside the German as well as the American in all of this thing. He saw fit to call the old colonel an old man. It was a joke like. You were how, how old now? 20, 25. 25. And so this man was an intelligence officer. His job was to gather information of the American forces and in specifically from the prisoners of war. What did they know about? It? What's the health condition, let us say, of General Hodges? Or what's the condition of the whole U.S. Army? Or what's going on? What are the plans of the Army? All these things. This is what he would like to hear. But from this soldier, he gets nothing. And from any soldier who obeys his, his own allegiance to America and his vows, he gets nothing. John, did you have any idea of the bigger picture of what was happening back in Bastogne or how the Americans oh, yes. were doing? Yes. Where I, did you get your information? Well, now, this whole force of three army groups must be well coordinated in their work together, you understand. They are not in the least bit. Uh, independent one of another. What one does affects the other and any staff officer or commander at almost any level must know, must have the feel at least of what's going on. But you're a prisoner of war. Well, but I'd only been there for 48 hours. But you have lost track of a major battle going on. Oh, I see. Uh, now I get your question. The German intelligence officer is probably more interested with the broader picture as things might look down the line a month away or two months away or uh, mm -hmm. the, the whole theater picture is what he thought he might get from a person at my position. If he was speaking to a buck private or a corporal recently out of a foxhole, he would be expecting something different. But knowing I'm on the staff of Hodges or Bradley or whatever, he understands that I must be quite aware of what's going on through the whole theater. Where did he get that information? Probably at his own uh, uh, war college back in Germany. He knows uh, how the American army operates. Now, how did he know you were on Hodges' staff? Well, for openers, if he's a lieutenant colonel, it means something mm -hmm. about upward somewhere. And he wants to find out. No, he did not know I was on this. I, I see. I've got myself in trouble. He did not know I was in Hodge's outfit. He did not know that. But if he knows I'm a lieutenant colonel, then I ought to know what a lieutenant colonel ought to know. Mm -hmm. There's an assumption that he makes here. here. I don't know whether I'm coming through very you well. Are. And you are now on the first day of 1945, is That's that correct? That's exactly right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we've been running an hour and a half approximately here today. Wow. Um, how close are we to your escaping, getting away? That will be about March uh, uh, 15, perhaps, uh, something like that. We're going to go from from Limburg uh, very soon after this event that I, we're, we're going to move next from here to Hamelburg, uh, which is where the American Army, General Patton's uh, a, a force from, from his army, attacked the camp at Hamelburg and uh, uh, big things happened. 
we took the surrender there of the of the German commander of that uh, camp. Wasn't there? Thank you. Wasn't there a point at which uh, you were a stretcher bearer or put to work carrying stretchers? Yes, that happened and in being Amelberg. fired at by the Americans. You were uh, well, a friendly I, fire came your way. Uh, that's true. This is Hamelburg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We we could work there, and I, I'll cut out as much stuff as I can. Though. No, I'm I'm advised we've got at least another twenty minutes left if you can take it. All right, let's take us to that point if okay. we can. Okay. Uh, from Limburg, after this uh, uh, interrogation had been com completed on New Year's Eve, he got from me everything that he wanted. I mean. Excuse me. Everything that I would give him, which dare I say, was nothing. Mm -hmm. He gave me a lot of information about the German army, which he used as bait to cause me to react and speak and things like that. And I did not see fit to react. At the same time, I wanted to learn about the German army. I still had hopes of uh, getting back to my army myself, myself, and I'd like to be able to report back about the German army. I don't want to get myself lost here, or you, but I only say by the time that night was over, or maybe after he had, he had had enough Johnny Walker, it may be that we closed up that conversation and uh, uh, I went back to my uh, solitary and from there on I was moved to another camp. We went on foot this time, marched through Cologne and Bonn to a place called Hamelburg. Hamelberg is known a little bit in the history book, but not well. And the next part of what I'm going to tell about is what happened at, at Hamelberg, uh, if that seemed to be in order. Yes, sir. We had about 1,700 uh, prisoners in Hamelberg. <clears throat> uh, some of these had been prisoners for maybe a few weeks before, uh, uh, before December 17. Uh, none longer than that. And I again was a senior American officer, and <coughs> uh, this is important in a way because from the German point of view, uh, whoever is their senior German officer has to have somebody to deal with in handling all of the human matters that seem to come up in every human situation. Problems come up, so he needs somebody to work with, and he works with me. <coughs> and we have uh, a tiny bit of respect for one another's position. At the same time, this one is give, giving away zero of America to Germany. I hope that I can have that understood. Can uh, I ask you a uh, question? Uh, yeah. uh, I'm impressed by the training you must have gotten at West Point and the experience you had bringing you up to the point of view you're in now, the, the situation you're in now. Uh -huh. Is there any course in West Point about what you do as a prisoner of war? At that time, there was no, no such thing. Whether it is today, 60 years later, I do not know. Mm -hmm. I can uh, some, uh, respond a bit if you don't think me sarcastic. We don't train at West Point to be prisoner of war. No, <laughs> That's I how I would that. have answered you 40 years ago. But it could be that today, with all the different kinds of events, it's quite possible that some way or other this has been introduced to the curriculum. But I would think that West Point's motto of duty, honor, country. In a way, the motto itself, which is thoroughly indoctrinated into every one of our graduates. It says a whole lot that does not need a lot of clarification. It means, among other things, don't give away the store. And I think that our graduates of West Point in all theaters of war have done a real fine job in that regard. So in that sense, you were, were you were well prepared for the role you were that was thrust upon you. In the sense of such as conscience, yes, and patriotism, and caring for the safety of my men wherever they may be, even if they're thrust upon me, never having known them until two minutes ago, they're my men, mm -hmm. and to take care of their health and welfare and spirit. Believe me, so important in a prison situation, the spirit of these men, that they do not become dejected or depressed or uh, uh, other uh, sad things that could happen. I figure it's my job to be, among other things, their cheerleader. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's what I saw fit to do, and I believe succeeded. And I understand from what you said a minute ago, you were rescued by a, a, a unit of General Patton's army? Yes, we yeah, right. We're almost to that point. We were in Hamburg for, I was in Hamburg for approximately, uh, I guess about seven weeks, <clears throat> uh, gaining uh, a kind of moral superiority over our German captors and having marvelous experience with fellow prisoners who were Serbs. Today we think of them as being ethnic cleansing in Serbia and all of that. And these are the men, or perhaps their grandfathers, who saved my life with food and other things at that time. It's hard uh, to do this without digressing, but many great things happened uh, in the prison camp. I don't think we'll take the time today to get into all of these about the Serbs and the South Africans and others who were in there. So very, very important. One day without, <coughs> without notice to me or anyone else, in came marching to our camp Colonel Paul R. Good, otherwise Pop Good, United States Army, well-known officer, an army colonel who was graduated from West Point the year of my birth, and uh, Colonel uh, Good came in with about 500 Americans from Poland, marching in in a terrible condition. Mind you, he was approaching 50 years old as he uh, crossed uh, 200 miles through the snow. And he came with about 500 prisoners from Stalag 64 in Poland, it turned out. And of course, my seniority as a senior American officer terminated right now with uh, Pop Good there. He, he came in with uh, about six months experience in prison and he had certain officers around him, including Lieutenant Colonel John Knight Waters, uh, was uh, one of his, uh, uh, we'll call it staff officers, and there were some 500 uh, mostly officers, not many enlisted men, mostly officers, marched across in the snow from their camp in Poland. Why is this happening? Because the Russians were approaching the Polish Stalag 64, from the east, that is yes. the German Stalag 64, in Poland, and Hitler's desire was to get them in, in country where they would not be released to the Germans. So 1,500 Americans had been released to Poland. 500 were successfully, out of 1,500, were reaching Hamelburg. And here, without any formality, I turned over my uh, senior American position to Pop Good and in turn John Waters. Well, <coughs> I have learned since, I didn't know it at the time, that, uh, that uh, to some extent we prisoners in Hamelburg were rather uh, criticized by some of the people coming in from Poland because we did not run a clean and orderly prison camp. I've thought that was a bit humorous, but uh, I'm not going to get very far into that matter at this time. I think we ran a pretty good one before they came. And uh, so in any event, they knew how one ought to run for the best interests of American uh, troops. And they knew, for example, that they could uh, establish uh, uh, recreational activities and uh, maybe educational activity and other things that would be beneficial to the morale of prisoners. We were too new to have learned a lot of this st stuff. So it was nice that Pop Good and Johnny Water came in and brought a lot of, a lot of their know-how with them on how to run from the American point of view, how to run the prison camp. And so I was pleased to turn over my responsibilities to them yeah. and help them then in carrying out their responsibilities as they saw them. Kind of an aside. The American Red Cross and the International Red Cross were uh, in the whole scene to help us all and to provide even from Natick uh, possibly socks that uh, might have been darned here at the Congregational Church or something and were sent over for our benefit and other things that were came over in what we called care packages from the American Red Cross. We were supposed to get one such package, uh, the plan was, per week. As it turned out, six men got one per month. So there wasn't much in it. But Pop Good knew better than I did how to get that stuff from his men by pulling different kinds of strings with the Germans maybe I hadn't caught up with yet. I'm not really apologizing. I'm thanking dear old Pop 
that he knew how to do some of this stuff and get our men better taken care of. So much pleased for that part of it. Lo and behold, a couple of weeks after Pop and Johnny Waters and these 500 men came into Hamelburg, augmenting our numbers to so, something more, I guess, than 2,000 uh, uh, forlorn prisoners of war. Uh, lo and behold, there, were, there was rifle fire, machine gun fire uh, in the vicinity. Uh, this by now is the uh, middle of March, although I may have the date a little off. I don't know, it's possible it was into April. I'm not sure. That this tank force, headed by Captain Abraham Baum, B-A-U-M, from Brooklyn, New York, a force of American tanks, 30 vehicles, 300 men, had been sent by General Patton, Commanding General of the Third Army, sent Captain Baum in for the purpose of breaking us out of camp, releasing us so that we might be able to escape back to the American lines. It is well known, fairly well known, to the extent Hamelberg is known, that John Waters was son-in-law of George Patton. There are some who feel that George Patton was motivated by the very presence of his own son-in-law, Johnny Waters, in that camp to cause him to break out of that camp. I do not buy into that, but I acknowledge the existence of the rumor. I'm acknowledging the existence of the rumor that his purpose was to free his son-in-law. I believe his purpose, his real purpose, and I had known General Patton and lots uh, personally and also in a more generic kind of way. I had known him for many years and it is my belief his purpose was to break out 2,000 prisoners of war and there is a big difference. I hope my point reasonably gets through. Yes sir, what, what did you do then? So, <clears throat> these tanks broke into the, through the barbed wire of the camp and the next thing that I can recall was that the second ranking officer, namely Johnny Waters, had unfurled from who knows where an American flag. And he marched out to meet Captain Baum and his forces. And ceasefire was declared. Things were happening very fast. The German Major General in command had surrendered to Pop Good. There's Pop now. We got no weapon. We don't have too much health or strength or anything else. We are, uh, Pop is now in command of the whole schmear, you can say. The German uh, prison guards and all uh, really fall under his command. But things are so uh, happening so fast that really to, to go through those kinds of, uh, of uh, relationships is sort of pointless, I think. And so uh, uh, Pop instructed us that we were to accompany uh, Captain Baum and his force of 300 men, 30 vehicles, most of which were tanks, some small tanks, some medium tanks, that we were to accompany that force back to the American lines in a sense that we would be carrying out General Patton's orders as we did this. <coughs> I feel a bit hurried, but I'm trying to get this thing to, so that it can be understood. So you had about 2,000 2, men, something like that. I could be wrong by 20 percent uh, or so, seeking to, uh, to go under Captain Baum. He's got the power. He's got the strength. He's got the will. He's got the help to go uh, th th with his 300 men as kind of his wards to get back home. None of us is any damn good, really. We're either sick or hungry or whatever. We're not really uh, soldiers to Mount Denley. We get only a mile or two out of the camp, and lo and behold, our force, in which uh, as many of us as could, were holding on to the hand grips of the tanks and the half tracks or in there. We were being fed uh, 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 sea rations and things by the uh, tank soldiers aboard Captain Baum's force. We were being cared for as well as we can, as he, he could do. Obviously, we couldn't have 2,000 men on 300 tanks, so some were kind of following along behind. Others may have quit and stayed back in Hamelburg. I don't really have the uh, detail in my brain about that, <clears throat> but in any event, we were hardly more than maybe two miles out of the camp when uh, Captain Baum halted his column and Colonel Popgood mounted on top of one of the tanks. Uh, by this time it was about dark on the day in question, maybe 4 p.m., uh, maybe 5 p.m. 
uh, at Mar in March in uh, Germany uh, was getting to be dark at least dusk and Colonel Good stood up on the tank there and he said like this, we are a burden to Captain Baum and his force. His force is at risk by having this burden on top of it. We must remove the burden from Captain Baum. If you believe you are physically fit and if you have a weapon, you may offer your services to Captain Baum to join his organization, his task force. If you do not have that, you have, I hereby give you two alternatives. Make your own way on your own, best way you can back to the American lines on your own. Good luck. Or accompany me back to the camp in Hamelburg and we will have the uh, impropriety or the dissatisfaction, whatever you want to call it, of surrendering back to the Germans. What choice did you make, John? I went with Colonel Good back to Hamelburg. Some of the young officers and soldiers went with the tanks. The tanks had a terrible time the rest of the day, uh, even to the extent that before the next day was over with, Captain Baum himself was among our prisoners back in Hamburg, almost beyond description, all this stuff. And nobody truly has a good record. When I first met you and Barbara and Robert here a few days ago, I brought with me my Hamelberg file, which I showed you was about one inch thick, and this described only one day, the day I'm now talking about, about what Hamelberg, uh, what occurred there. We could go into that later, let's say out of section. We could go into that just uh, for whatever purposes we might have. But it was a huge day. Lots of stuff happened. And Baum uh, went back that following day, I, I've learned this later, and <laughs> he managed to uh, conceal himself for what he uh, actually was and pretend to be one of us who had been a prisoner for a long time. And the Germans never detected that he was the captain who had come in and busted open mm -hmm. that camp. This was, I mean, an awful lot of real excitement. To read it is a lot of thrills, I suppose, and maybe scary, and all of the various kinds, in some cases, of heroism that were done uh, at this time. But I guess we shouldn't probably get too bogged down in that. That's okay, but John, we are literally out of time and tape. Can understand. you, in how much time do we have, Barbara? <laughs> uh, okay, John, can yep. you, um, get yourself home to the United States of America in the next 10 minutes? Oh no, nowhere near. I can't get e even get out of Germany. <laughs> We're not ready. Oh, I can. I, 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 I don't like to rush you. If but the tenor of how we're going is reasonably acceptable, we need uh, another probably uh, 30 minutes. To do that. Yeah, we can't do that today. If you wanted at the rate I'm trying to discipline myself to handle it. Then. Yeah, I guess we can't handle that today, John. I think I think that's right. Okay, so we're going to wind it up for today. I think yeah. uh, you've been a good soldier today and given us a lot of your time. Uh, let's wind Please down do. the camera. Thank you very much. Okay. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and I hope that none of this rather extemporaneous. Uh, sort of discussion that I give uh, leaves any uh, falsities or misunderstandings. Not at all, and this it's is history, John. This is history. Thank you. Thank you.